This is Vision OS, Apple's first ever spatial operating system. You navigate with your eyes. Simply tap to select, flick to scroll. I want to build that. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard of Apple's now Vision Pro. Vision Pro. The Apple Vision Pro. Vision Pro. Vision Pro. They're submarine goggles, <laughs> I mean, mixed reality headsets, that are equipped with the same chip that goes on a MacBook. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I saw the announcement video and just how incredible the technology looked, I just knew that I had to work on it. You see, all the mainstream VR headsets right now are primarily made for playing games, which to me isn't that interesting. But Apple isn't just building a gaming headset. It's a general purpose headset that you can use to browse the web, text your friends, take pictures, essentially anything that you can do with a phone or a computer on your head. Now that's cool. To do that, we're gonna need to build our very own of what Apple calls a spatial operating system. Now I don't know how I'm gonna do that because I haven't even taken my operating system course in uni yet. Um, so anyways, let's start building it. Now, before we dive into anything, we first need to get an intuition of how any VR technology works under the hood. And a helpful analogy is to think about how video games are designed. When you're playing a video game, you're essentially entering a virtual world crafted by developers. Now, you don't just see the entire virtual world, else you can't play it. It's displayed to you through this virtual camera. So when you're moving around using your mouse and keyboard, you're actually just updating the position of this virtual camera. The only difference in VR games is that instead of a mouse or a keyboard, it's the orientation of the headset and therefore your head that's used to determine the orientation of this virtual camera. And so for these VR technologies to be fully immersive, the headset needs to have extremely good head tracking to give you the illusion that you are actually inside this virtual world and looking around seamlessly. Uh, hello? What, can I help you? Lots of older VR headsets like the Valve Index came with what are called base stations, which you would install in your room and communicate with the headset through infrared signals. Now that's called outside-in tracking, and it's not as commonly used nowadays because, you guessed it, it's very tedious to set up and you'd only be able to use it in your room. The other more common way which we're going to try and implement is called inside-out tracking. The basic idea is to install fixed cameras on the headset, and by looking at the video feeds, we can somehow infer how it's moving relative to the outside world. And this is a really hard problem. But Steven, this is really simple. Just use an IMU. Hold up. Wait a minute. Well, here I've got an Arduino connected to a MPU 6050, which is a very popular IMU. And if we just try to plot the readings of the roll, pitch, and yaw values, you'll see that even though the IMU isn't moving, the readings tell you that somehow it's feeling that there's some sort of movement going on. And this is due to the nature of these IMUs. There's a lot of drift. So if we want something more reliable, we're going to need something a little more complicated. And the technique we're going to be using is called visual slam. If you watched my previous videos, you might have heard of the term which I used to map out a building and race my RC car in and crash my car like 50 times. Yeah, we don't talk about it. The slam algorithm that I was using in these videos was based on a 2D LiDAR. But now we need to take it up a notch because we're working in 3D. And I could use a 3D LiDAR, but that's going to be way too big to fit onto our headset. And more importantly, I can't afford it. So instead, I bought a very cheap camera from AliExpress. Oh God. Now, while we're waiting for that order to arrive, let's try to understand how SLAM using a camera works. Let's say that you're looking at a chair through a camera feed. Between two consecutive frames, you notice that the entire chair has moved by three pixels to the left. Since we know that the chair hasn't actually moved in the real world, we can infer that it is due to the camera moving by three pixels to the right. In practice, we detect something called features and try to match these across consecutive images. And once we have a matching, then we know exactly how much each of these features have moved between frames and can therefore infer how our camera has moved, right? Well, there's another problem because these images are in 2D, but when our head is moving and tilting, we're not moving in pixels, we're moving in a 3D world. So if somehow there was a way to obtain the 3D coordinates for each of these features, 
Well, there's actually a way to do that, but we need to cheat a little bit. You see, there are very special kinds of cameras called stereo cameras, which are simply two cameras next to each other. And using these cameras, we can measure something called disparity, which tells us how much a pixel has moved between a stereo image pair. Okay, I know this sounds kind of scary, but trust me, this is exactly how humans perceive depth. Let me show you. Focus on a point very far away and put your finger in front of your face. You'll actually see two fingers. One comes from your left eye and one comes from your right eye. Now, the distance between these two fingers is the equivalent of disparity for stereo cameras. As you gradually move your finger further and further away, you'll notice that the distance gets smaller and smaller, and therefore a smaller disparity. And so simply, the true distance to your finger is inversely proportional to the disparity multiplied by some constant. All right, so the stereo camera finally arrived after two weeks, and here it is, the beautiful thing. You can see that there are two separate cameras, and yeah, this was a good purchase. Except... This whole camera fell off. Bye. This was a hundred freaking dollars, man. Don't think I'm going to be able to repair this. <sighs> so we need to get another one. The following day. I broke my camera, I went to Dave. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's part of the story. Okay. Wow, very cool. So I've got um, a mini. I yeah. think it would probably be a better fit if it's yes. like... Yes, on the head. So, okay, I just got back, Dave so was super nice and he borrowed me these Z stereo cameras, which are amazing, wow. they're like $500 or more each. So I've got all the drivers installed, so now I just want to make sure that this works. Ooh. So we're going to run the Z Explorer, the Z Explorer is opening, come on, there we go, oh my god, this is so nice. Yo, this is so smooth. All right, enough fooling around. It's time to start coding. Let's implement Visual Slam from scratch first by calculating the disparity. We're gonna be using semi-glow matching or SGM for short, which finds the closest neighboring pixel patch to compute disparity. We're gonna try values. and run the disparity algorithm. All right, so we've got this disparity, but we actually want the depth values. So let's apply the formula I showed you guys. Um, what the hell is this? It's been a week trying to figure out why this depth image is not working. I don't understand. You still can salt my friend because I still can't figure it out. You capture your left and your right image, clear disparity at time t, right? Sorry, I'm not listening. I was too busy yeah. looking at myself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Search from C to Python because I can't be bothered to debug in C. So now we have this depth image, and I also have these features that I'm tracking across consecutive time frames. Now we need to figure out how the camera is moving with respect to those features. So I went online, I found this equation that I could use. So you're just taking the error and you're trying to minimize this error across two time frames. I got it working, but then it's incorrect like it just like the camera jumps around like crazy i must acquire more knowledge learn about how cameras work epipolar geometry v squares pnp icp p3p ransack structure for motion bang words oh my god oh my god let me just be honest with you guys for a sec because i did not realize how insanely hard like i knew this was going to be hard but i didn't know how absolutely insanely hard it is to write visual slam from scratch remember we're doing all of this work just so we can figure out the orientation of this headset in space. Now, a big part of why SLAM is so hard is because in the real world, sensor measurements are noisy, even for a camera. You see, the estimated depth values are not always perfect. Even when we're matching features across frames, sometimes they're wrong. Now, these could be due to a variety of reasons, similar image features, occlusions, sudden lighting changes, or fast camera movements causing motion blur. And so there's one more important technique that we need to implement called graph optimization to better correct for these errors over time. The idea is to model SLAM as a graph problem where the vertices represent the unknowns, in this case, our camera poses across time, as well as the 3D landmarks. And the edges represent our actual measurements where these features are in 2D from the perspective of the camera. Now, because we're tracking these features across multiple frames, the same landmark can be observed across multiple camera poses. And so for each of these camera poses, we can actually calculate where this landmark should appear on the image. This error between where we think it should be and where we actually observe it to be is called the reprojection error. Now, notice that we can shift any of these vertices and we'll get a slightly different reprojection error. And so graph optimization, at its core, all it's doing is shifting around these vertices and figuring out a global configuration that minimizes these errors. And this is how we solve SLAM. I used the G2 library to do the graph optimization. It's very popular in the SLAM world. And all you need to do is set up your vertices and your edges and G2 will take care of optimizing your graph. 
All right, good morning, guys. I think I finally have my graph optimization working. I stayed up till 3.30 last night to debug this. This is one of these things where it's easy at a high level, but actually implementing it is such a pain in the ass. But I think, I think I got something, so. I'm using this TUM RGBD dataset, which has ground truth pose measured from motion capture data, and I'm comparing it to the pose estimated by my visual slam algorithm. Let me see if, if it works. Come on, come on, come on. Oh my God, it's terrible. No. Now by this point, I had already spent four days Guys, working on it, and I really didn't have any more time. Now I did try it without running graph optimization and I got an error of around 15 centimeters on the data set which is relatively good except that when you look at state-of-the-art SLAM implementations they're only off by a centimeter or not even. And this is how it looks if we use my current SLAM implementation on the VR headset and you can see that it's absolutely terrible. So I will open source my code if someone wants to take a look and point out some things that I'm doing wrong. That would be really appreciative. But for now, I think I need to stick to an open source implementation. Now you might be asking yourself why I decided to even embark on this journey to write Visual Slam from scratch when I could have just taken an open source implementation. And to that, I would say that, of course I could have done that, but I really value learning. And I think the best way to learn something is to build that thing. As much as you can watch lectures and you can listen to what people say, unless you experience building the very thing yourself, you'll never get that depth of understanding because you're not the one making those design decisions and weighing the trade-offs. Now that's not to say that you have to build everything from scratch because yeah, look at me, it takes so much time. But I really believe that if you want to learn something deeply and well, then the best way to go about it is to build it. All right, so I've got a slightly different Z camera because I had to give back the older one to Dave. It's essentially the same stereo camera and I'm running the SLAM algorithm on it. I prepared a bit of software so that we actually have something that looks like the Vision Pro OS. And now that we have a working SLAM algorithm, let's try and run it and show you guys how cool it looks. Now, obviously I don't have the hardware for a VR headset right now because this would go on a VR headset and I'll be able to wear the VR headset. So instead, the second next best thing to do is I got some tape and we're gonna tape this to my head. So, oh, this is sick, okay. All right, all right. Let, me, let me make sure you guys can see me well. So, my headset is running and you can see that it's sort of floating in space. And as I move my head around, you can see that it's still floating in space and not moving. So we're keeping these icons fixed in space and we're figuring out how to render these icons based on the position of the camera, which we've determined through our SLAM algorithm. And this is what gives the illusion that these icons aren't actually moving. Now, obviously these are just static images right now, but eventually we wanna be able to click these icons and actually use the apps. And a very important feature we'll need is hand tracking and eye tracking, but that's for the next video. I think overall for now, I'm pretty satisfied with what I created. Now, of course, I haven't built out the entire OS. I want to go a bit more into the explanation of how this is actually rendered. There's a bit more I need to talk about, like transforms, because the background video is actually moving in space together with this camera to give you the illusion that the video is not moving. But if you're interested, make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave a thumbs up, and let me know what you guys think. This video took so long to make, so I'm really sorry, but um, I'm excited to be back and making more videos regularly. So if you're excited, leave a thumbs up, and I'll see you guys in the next video.